Well, actually, my, my question is, well, you can answer whoever, but, but for the, your presentation. I am Francisco Amsler from Argentina, Major B. And, uh, well, I saw in your presentation um, there was this, this possibility of a post keynesian ecological multiplier, super multiplier, and that would be able to uh, tackle both like well-being, the ecological restriction by lowering uh, aggregate consumption. And I wonder like how is that logic? I haven't read of course that, that paper, but I'm just looking here at data is World Bank 2017, 43% of poverty uh, worldwide below uh, $5.5 dollars per, um, per day, I think which is mostly like the um, upper middle income country poverty. So that would be even quite po poor still if, if you see a, um, a conception, uh, conception of poverty in, in a developed country, right? And that's around four billions of persons. It's like almost half of the po entire worldwide population. So I wonder how <laughs> is it possible to think like lowering aggregate consumption. I mean, you can think, of course, that you can lower the, the consumption of the other half, let's say, of the world, but, but I don't really see how uh, you can still think of well-being. Mm -hmm. And I say this because sometimes, especially when, um, and I, I don't want to be offensive at all, but especially when, when I hear um, economists from the, the developed countries, there is this kind of, uh, I think an, an idea of, well, in developing countries, you should like sort of accept a certain level of, of well-being because it's not that important, you know, you, you don't have to be materialistic. And I think that that is a very unfair point of view. So if you can explain that model and what's your position on it. Should we collect two or three questions? Uh, yeah. Got a couple over here. Uh, hello, my name is Lorena. I am from El Salvador. Thank you for such insightful presentations. I have a lot of ideas, but the one that resonates the most is I find a lot of connections between uh, the contributions of ecological economics and climate change economic models with uh, theories on social reproduction. Help. However, in the literature, I find very little connections between both um, perspectives. And I think that following uh, Juan and Carol's idea, idea of building narratives from the margins, I think it's super important to consider social reproduction and um, an intersectional approach to, to this uh, perspectives on climate change and ecological economics, uh, because it will, this, like, the impacts of climate change are not equal, no. are not equal among countries and among, among people, depending on our gender, our race, our income, etc. So, do you know of any work that integrates both perspectives or authors because I haven't been able to find much and I'm super interested. So, or your insight on this also. I think there's another question over here and then I can answer and then we can go to the back. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Luca, I'm from Germany. I'm also from the B branch and um, so basically my question would be if you have some concrete policy proposals that come along with these mm -hmm. models because my personal feeling regards models is that they are in like or you in yourself raised this point that they are convincing and they are the ones that might persuade policy um yeah uh, policy makers so I, I would be just curious if you yourself have some concrete policy proposals um, connected to specific modules, uh, models and 
um, because I think this is for me personally where we have to get yeah. at at the end of the day. Yeah. So. So maybe I can I can jump in with a couple answers, and then we can do some more. Um, I'll save this one for you because I think that was a question mainly to you. Um, yeah. It, except just to say that from my perspective of this type of modeling, I think that's why I like doing it in an integrated way um, in which we're not starting with the question of we need, we're not starting with the assumption that we need to reduce growth and then figuring out how to do it, but we're starting with the, the assumption that we need to decarbonize and then seeing what does that imply for growth. Um, and if we can have that with growth, that's fine. Like, I don't, I don't care. Um, and, and I think that that's just kind of a nice model framework. Um, and then it's, it also allows you to ask the questions you're most interested in. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of work in putting development into these models, because right now they sort of just assume that all the developing world will grow like China at some point, that you'll just have like 8% growth at some point, um, which like, again, maybe, but there's more interesting stories. Um, on the social reproduction, I think that's super exciting. Um, so I, I wrote an essay sort of listing some of the different things that heterodox economics could do. And it, it seems like there's such a need for a gendered climate damage function that can show the breakdown uh, of how, how climate damages will be spread throughout households and then try to take that and feed that back into a social reproduction function. So say if all of the, the um, if all of the uh, damages are going to be put on the same people who are, have all of the care work responsibilities, what does that then mean for economic development? Um, and, and I don't know if I, I don't know of anyone doing that, um, but I don't, I wouldn't not know if that makes sense. It, it's sort of not my literature, but I think it's really exciting and the, that there's so much work to be done in that. Um, and then concrete proposals, absolutely. Um, I think that on the tech, a lot of this comes on the technology side. So one of the big things that this modeling framework has agreed on is that nuclear energy is incredibly expensive and that we probably aren't going to have a lot of it um, in most all of the scenarios, which it's something that like as a non-expert, I have no way to really know that. But when they try to put this all in, like however they run it, unless you just assume fission or fusion kind of comes out of nowhere, like there's not a lot of role for it in the modeling. So I think that could be a policy proposal from that of saying like, that's probably not where you want to focus your development. Um, I think, um, there's a, a really interesting one from this Medeas model looking at electric vehicles and the limits of that. Um, and the basic story is that when you do this in an integrated way, the, the electric vehicles are competing with solar panels and other renewable energies for the same types of supply chain issues for some of the same minerals and materials. And so if you try to scale them both up at the same time, you'll limit one of the others. And so there's sort of a sequencing issue that like, yes, eventually we need electric vehicles, but we need to do the renewable energy first um, while still developing that technology. And again, that's something that like, I wouldn't have necessarily known, but you put it all into one big thing together. Um, and then finally, just this question of sort of degrowth, post-growth is another thing you can play with in these models. So the, the, the post-Keynesian one, one of the, the stories that they tell in this is that if you try to do a green growth approach, um, you end up, the growth ends up needing such an expansion in renewable energy to keep up with it that you have to burn more coal than you would have expected if you hadn't had the growth and so you miss your climate targets and that the only way that you can really hit the climate targets is if you're targeting a much lower rate of growth. Um, and then there's all the social questions beyond that. But, but it's sort of a way, it's a way you can make an argument that that can kind of be quite easily understood, I think, but then also you have this like crazy amount of extra data behind it. So it's not just like, here's my three equations, but like, look what I did, it's crazy. So, so I think so, yeah. And I don't know if you wanna jump in here and then we'll do another couple rounds, another round. Okay, we have four minutes, so yeah, let's, four, let's do a round. One or two questions. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's gonna be quick on questions, but I'll let you play, so it's, it, it'll still be fun. I'll try to keep it yeah. very, very quickly. Peter from the ecological transition uh, path. I was just wondering what's your view with regard, obviously these models are useful in some way, and it's great that they're getting a bit more realistic and not just mm -hmm. completely disregarding things, but just looking at this radical uncertainty and complexity, looking at tipping points and like the, the ecosystems that are really, really, really difficult to model yeah. and where we just 
have this radical uncertainty where it's still not really, really problematic having certain models which then seem to imply a lot of certainty, and which especially, mm -hmm. as you've pointed out, these gatekeepers are yeah. using for, well, slowing every bit of climate action they can slow. So I'm wondering whether even the best kind of post-growth models still have a problematic side to Hi, Josh from CE3 and from South Africa. Um, I liked uh, Juan's uh, analogy of the two boats in the same storm, right? But I think while that's true in terms of uh, who needs to take res like responsibility and responsibility shifting, one boat kind of has brought about the storm, right? Yeah. And so whether we think about uh, addressing climate change in like northern countries, I think that's where decarbonization generally has to happen. Uh, my interest is how this affects um, like the development patterns in global south, right? So if northern countries decrease trade and consumption, how does this affect supply chains in the global south? How does this affect FDI, considering the large amounts of investment that need to go into uh, decarbonization? Um, has this been modeled econometrically? Is this possible or more of a science fiction type deal? Um, and how do we think about the parameters uh, if you're looking to do that kind of analysis? Okay, hi, Valentin from Italy. We know each other. So, <laughs> hi. Um, first of all, thanks for the presentation. Like also the presenters, it's one of the only lectures that I feel more optimistic afterwards, and that's like really something. <laughs> so my question is like, I really want to like make sure it's a question, not a critique. It's just like, I feel like those models, they are like very applicable to like a certain part of our population that like are interested in this. But the social discourse we lead is like, I don't know, it's like the solutions for those issues are like, I think very apparent. The first steps we already know, but we're not taking them. So I just want to know if you personally feel that like a refinement of the argument we're having could actually like tip over this dialogue we're having in our society. Yeah, okay. So um, some quick answers. Could you try to get the, um, the web page up, one of the two of you on, on there? I don't actually know how that works for the next thing. Um, so on, on the question of radical uncertainty uh, and sort of the, the issue there, I think that this is really the call for needing more scenarios. Um, and so in, in one of the papers that I had written, I, I quoted a guy who wrote this article in Nature saying, we need more extreme scenarios. Um, we need scenarios of global wars, of global realignments. Um, we need scenarios where there's like all kinds of big crazy things that happen, where there's like reactions against technology, where there's changes in labor relations. Um, and like we, we're not doing that. And, and I think that, no, it doesn't get rid of the problem, but it, it does a better job of showing the possibilities and showing what's excluded from the core of the model itself when you can then go and add things in there. Um, and so that paper was published in like the end of February 2020, um, like the week before the world started shutting down and it did not mention pandemics anywhere in the, the list of extremes that it wanted you to model. So there's another one. What if we have a pandemic every 10 years? Like what does that do? What does this look like? Um, so for, for the development, issue on all of this. Um, I think that that's a big, um, a big missing piece of this, this modeling framework. Um, but I guess it's, it's kind of a missing piece more generally in, within mainstream economic modeling. Um, I think the questions of, of sort of the trade and, and, and how this is going to work, you end up with, you can end up with, um, how would you say, not great results in which the energy transition is done in a way that makes Europe and North America way richer um, because they're the ones with all the patents and the manufacturing um, and sort of the technological base. And then they're selling things to the developing world, which then builds up debt flows um, and then drives more problems. And, and so again, like, yeah, it's all kind of obvious in our world at least, but I think putting it in that language and showing, okay, if you do this, this fast decarbonization thing, like, 
what problem does this call, cause for different places. Um, I think the models are quite good at picking up that it's going to be bad for states with lots of coal and petroleum, um, but it's much less bad, much less useful at looking at um, sort of levels of industrial development um, and just the questions of manufacturing. Um, so I, I think that you're very much right to identify that as a big black hole in the middle of this type of modeling. Um, and even the post-Keynesian model that, that is here doesn't go into this. Um, like there's like kind of regional stratification, but there's not like finance. There's not like a lot of the other things. So there's work to be done. Um, and then I guess it's just a question of whether, whether you think this kind of modeling is a place where that makes sense to do it or, or, if, or if you do it somewhere else. Um, yeah, and then sort of the, the theory of change question, right? About like, how does this work? Um, and I think I very much agree that telling, having better models and telling better stories is not going to fix climate change. Um, that's not how it's going to work. Uh, I think we all kind of know that, but I think it's necessary but not sufficient, um, if I can say that, that we need things from below. We need things, um, we need changes in power. Um, but if we have those changes in power, but then we as academics aren't ready with, with more specific plans, it, it'll slow down the progress. And so that's, that's part of our work uh, of really I mean, recognizing what we can do, we all have quite a very specific skill set here, um, and then thinking how can that most relevantly be applied to fixing whatever problems we think are important. Uh, for me, I've kind of latched onto this, this climate problem, and so I'm trying to think how can I do what I can do. Um,